we send you warm and loving greetings from uh, the city of Harare in Zimbabwe. Uh, we pray that you are well and you are keeping safe during this time of COVID and uh, under lockdown. Um, <clears throat> we here at Kingdom People Church are continuing with a series called The Red Letters, if you are joining us for the first time. And we pray that you'll be blessed as uh, one of our elders and leaders uh, comes and shares with you uh, today. Rob, would you come through and I can pray for you. Father, we thank you for uh, Rob. We thank you for the life that you have given him. We thank you for pressing upon him a desire for uh, your word and uh, to see your purpose fulfilled in the lives of uh, others, Lord God. And we pray that uh, today as he shares, that your heart would uh, uh, be shared, Lord God. I pray that men and women's hearts would be moved in a mighty way. I pray that you would do a mighty miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Farai. So as Farai said, we are continuing with our series called The Red Letters. And uh, the reason we chose that name for the series is we are going through the book of Luke, looking at places where Jesus has spoken and those words have been recorded. Because we feel that uh, it's important for us as Christians to know what Jesus said. Not just an opinion, not uh, some sort of motivational thing, but what did Jesus actually say that was relevant to Christians then? Knowing that what he said then is relevant to Christians today. So today we're looking at uh, a passage in Luke chapter 12 from verses 1 to 12. And I've entitled my message, God Knows Everything. I'll read that passage for you, beginning in verse 1, and it goes like this in the English Standard Version. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and, what, and that which you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on housetops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you of, of whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, Fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So when you read that, it looks like it could be two sections or even two different messages but I believe those sections lead into each other like like Jesus is developing some kind of thought so the first section is in verses 1 to 7 and the first thing we notice Jesus say in this passage is beware the leaven of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy as we know that uh, um, you know from our lives hypocrisy is, is something where People say something and then act in a completely different or perhaps opposite way. The same uh, passage is found in, in Matthew, and I'll read from uh, verse 5 to verse 12 of chapter 16. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they began discussing amongst themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing amongst yourselves the fact that you have no bread? 
Do you not perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves or the five thousand? And how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves and the four thousand? And how many baskets you gathered? How is it <clears throat> that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So the first time we see the mention of leaven in the Bible is in Exodus chapter 12, where God and Moses are having a discussion about the Passover. Leaven is something you put into dough to make bread rise. These days we would call it yeast or baking powder or something that makes um, your bread or your cake rise and when you cut it you see little bubbles and that's the result of leaven. But leaven is also known as a pervasive influence, something that pervades, it gets deep inside something, that modifies something or transforms it for the better. Yeast, leaven, feeds on sugars and converts them to alcohol. It's a, a fermentation or a decomposition process. So it's changing things from one state to another. It gives the bread or the cake life. Um, they use it in beer to make a, you know, a nice brown brew that many people around the world drink. Um, and it's an alcohol. So it is a fermentation process that takes place as a result of the leaven or the yeast. So, in that context, it's used in a positive way. But God forbade leaven to be used for the Passover feast, partly because it takes time for bread to rise. You know, if you've ever made bread, you know that you need to let it to stand, to prove, and it rises, and then you, you know, might knead it up some more, and then you bake it. But it's also, the word leaven is used in the Bible as a symbol of sin and corruption. And if we look at it in the context of decomposition, that's what happens to bodies when they die. The body, our physical bodies, become corrupt. They, they begin to die, break down as they decompose and get eaten by uh, worms and ants and things that live in the ground. But God uses it to indicate some kind of hidden or pervasive growth, something that grows inside us that may not necessarily be good for us. So leaven can improve some things, but it can also make things deteriorate. Sometimes if we ferment things too much, that thing becomes unpleasant. If you've ever tasted uh, a milk product that's been fermented too far, it's tart, it's, it's sour, it has a nasty bite to it. And if we you know, uh, ferment other things too far, um, it, they begin to be, be, be un unpleasant to the taste. And that's what can happen to us as Christians. If we take on offence, if we take on bitterness, um, at first you don't see it apart from occasional bur uh, bursts of anger, but later in life we begin to see bitter and twisted old people and they become unpleasant, not nice to be around, not the kind of place you'd love to send your children to visit granddad when they're just grumpy. My children call me a curmudgeon, which is a grumpy old man, but I don't believe that's because I'm full of leaven, just because I don't give them their way and everything. But <clears throat> It's that pervasiveness that Jesus wants to warn us of. Hypocrisy is something that ferments inside of us and turns us bitter and unpleasant and unacceptable to God. And what is inside us is stuff that is hidden from view. It hardens our heart to the work of the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about things that are hidden here. And verses 2 and 3 of that passage back it up. Nothing that is hidden will remain so, or will be revealed. So it warns us also that we must not be guilty of what the Pharisees were guilty of. So not guilty of, of talking wonderfully about Christianity, but being nasty people and tearing others down, and, and living a lifestyle that is contrary to the words we've spoken. So lives, our lives are always compared with our words. People, people always judge us by what we say versus how we act. So if we uh, swear and curse and get drunk, um, then people look at us and they go, yeah, that's about right. That's the kind of person we expect. But if we 
uh, you know, live a great life in church and then go outside and swear and curse and get drunk. Then immediately we are judges. I thought that person was a Christian. But what Jesus says is that everything we have ever said or done in secret will be revealed. So we may have a secret life. We may, you know, look like a great Christian on the outside, look like a, a God-loving person, and we may go home and be a nasty husband or wife, a, a lousy parent, or we might, you know, be addicted to pornography or something. One day, everybody will know exactly what the truth of our lives is. If you're a, if you've ever studied psychology, and, and I use this as an abbreviation, but people will will tell you that we have three uh, selves. We have the projected self, the self we want everybody to see, whether we are look like we've got it all together, where we you know, spend time making ourselves look good and act good, and we, we've got a nice car, and a, you know, we, we paint the picture of somebody who's really arrived. That's the projected self. Then there's the perceived self. How, I, how do I really see myself? And often what we project and what we perceive of ourselves are, are opposite, or they're a denial. So sometimes we project something really good because we feel really bad about ourselves. I look good to cover up for the fact that I don't feel good. And the third self we have is the real self, who we really are. What are we really like? What kind of characters do we really have when nobody else is looking? And that when there's, when there's a huge discrepancy between those three selves is exactly what Jesus is talking about. When we project something that we aren't, when we feel something that is contrary to what we really are, and none of them add up uh, to, to, to look at the real self. That is hypocrisy. Sometimes it's the fruit of denial. We, just, we don't even realize we're doing it. We really uh, believe the lies we teach ourselves and we tell ourselves. And that is a terrible place to be. But sometimes we do this knowingly. And that is what God is warning us about today. So it's an even bigger warning that comes after that. It's Jesus says, don't worry about that person who might kill you. Because once they've killed you, that's it. It's all done. It's all over. They, they can't be taken any further. But Jesus wants us to be more concerned about the eternal judgment of God. And this, uh, to me, refers to the secret lives. Every word we've ever spoken will be held accountable for. And that is the judgment I believe God will have. We might profess to be Christians, we might not, but either way, we're still going to face some kind of judgment at the end of time. And I would rather be an honest person meeting God and saying, yeah, yeah, I agree, I did all those things, I'm not proud of it, than to be a person who lived a lie and, didn't, and then denied it in front of, you know, in front of man has to live that in front of our God. And what God says is that every hair on our head is numbered. And I know that for some people who've lost hair over the years, that's not such a big deal. We'd like to number our own hair as well. But the fact that God says this indicates that He actually knows everything. There's no question about, you know, oh, I can do this in secret, nobody will see. God sees. And it's a good time for us to reflect on, on whether we, we do or, or carry on in a certain lifestyle that we are not proud of. And, and God sees that. And would we be pleased if we, if we were to act that way in front of family or friends or in public? And if, we, if there's stuff that we do in our private, in private lives that uh, we wouldn't be pleased for other people to know about, imagine how much worse it's going to be if we were doing that in front of God, knowing full well that he is our witness. But God sees all the sparrows. And what Jesus goes on to say is that actually he cares more about the sparrows than he does, sorry, he cares less about the sparrows than he does about us. He cares more about us than the sparrows. But he cares for the sparrows. So he says, if God knows the hairs on our heads and when a sparrow dies, he surely knows the thoughts and the intents of our hearts and every word that we speak. But we not, must not fear this, because God has placed a higher value on us than upon those sparrows, as I said. But we must not let hypocrisy become part of our lives. Hebrews 3.13 warns us 
that hardness in our hearts comes from the deceitfulness of sin. And hypocrisy is a sin. And if we continue to live in, in hypocritical life, or we complete, or we live in sin, in, in, without even being hypocritical about it, we can harden our hearts to what God is trying to do in our lives. And that's what Jesus really wants to warn us about. He doesn't want us to harden our hearts. He wants to actually take away our heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, a heart that is tender, uh, that is receptive to the things of the Holy Spirit, and that um, is, is receptive to the things of God. So what about the next section? I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man, will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So carrying on from the theme of what we say, then Jesus talks about what we say about Him. What do we say about Him? Sometimes publicly we profess Jesus as Lord, but when we go home we even forget those kind of words. And we take His name in vain, for example, in conversation. And the big question is, when people ask you, what do you say to them about Jesus? If they ask you about your beliefs, about your, your religious life, your, your spiritual life, what do you say about Jesus? Do you deny Him? Or do you stand up for everything that He stood for and lived about in your real life? What do you say about the Holy Spirit? What do you say to the Holy Spirit? Remembering that He hears the things that we are about to say while there's still thoughts. He knows our actions and our words before we act or speak. And this is where the crunch comes. A lot of people have asked the question about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because in, in, in other translations, it's the only sin that we can commit that, that we will not be forgiven of. And uh, we've discussed this throughout many years of my life. I've discussed with people about you know, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And various uh, theories have come across that you know, if we've ever experienced the gift of the Holy Spirit, whether we've been, uh, people have prophesied over us, or we've prophesied over people, and then later we say, well, that was just, you know, I had too much pizza. Or, you know, it was, we were drunk. Or, you know, there was just somebody playing up. That, in a way, is denying an action of the Holy Spirit. But I actually think it goes a bit deeper than that. And I'd like to read a, um, a definition by J.D. Greer, who's a, a minister of the Gospel. Blasphemy against the Spirit is any hardened and consistent stance against God. We all have moments, even sustained periods of our lives, where we defy God. I've been there, done it myself. <clears throat> but there may come a point in a person's life when that becomes an unyielding defiance against God, and he or she refuses to let the Spirit speak. At that point, God finally says, you want to do this on your own? You want to put me out of your life? Okay, have it your own way. Or to put it another way, the only unpardonable sin is refusing to let God pardon you. I'll say that again. The only unpardonable sin is refusing to let God pardon you. In this day and age, there's a tremendous uh, move and philosophy that says, actually, you're your master of your own destiny. You must look after number one. You must, uh, you know, you're you're the most important person in life, and, and you know, go out and look after yourself. Uh, I've used this illustration before, but a few years ago, um, one of the big shopping chains around uh, the country used to have a slogan: "Good for you." And then a few years ago, on that well, same billboard, they crossed out the "you" and wrote in "me." Good for me, and. It showed how, to me, it showed how the ideology of, of society has become more focused on self than it is on the people around us. 
And ultimately, this is the complete contrast of what the Christian faith is all about. Because we, as men, become our own gods. I've recently been studying um, some history of doctrine. And uh, one of the, the, the biggest uh, standoffs between the two major theologies, which are Calvinism and Arminianism, is that Calvinism says, it's up to God to save us. It's up to God to lead us to a point of salvation. Whereas Arminians say that, um, actually, we can come to that decision on our own. We, we can, out of our own will, out of our own desire, we can choose to follow God. And I said, really adhere to that way of thinking that we had a free will, and that free will allowed us to pick and choose and, and eventually come to a point of being persuaded that Christianity was real and that Jesus was the Savior, and then I could make a choice to follow Christ. But what that really says is, that man has power of his own salvation. And sometimes we try to have power over our salvation without the involvement of God or even the acknowledgement of God. So if I do enough good things, I can be saved. If, I, you know, if I'm good to, to widows and orphans and, and I help the community and let people take water from my borehole and I do all that kind of wonderful stuff, I'll, I'll earn my self enough brownie points to get into heaven. This, in a way, is leaven of the Pharisees, because the Pharisees used to teach that the outward appearance, the way we behave and act in public, is way more important than what's going on inside. And I know that you can look good on the outside. You can, you can give your house a lovely coat of paint. But inside, there can be litter everywhere, there can be chicken bones thrown around, the dog threw up in the corner, or whatever, whatever nasty thing you can think of can happen. On the outside, the house looks amazing, but on the inside, it's rotten. And I heard this illustration, and I'll use it um, again, because it, it, it helps us with the effect. We can get one of those nice metal dustbins that we used to all get in the good old days, and put them in our kitchen. Once you put your foot in the pedal, and the lid opens, and we throw our rubbish inside, and the lid closes. And we can paint that dustbin with flowers and butterflies and, and little children playing in the garden. And it looks amazing sitting in the corner of our kitchen waiting to receive a bit of rubbish. But if we had a bit of leftover meat or, or fish is a good one, and uh, it was not quite right, and we throw it in the dustbin and we leave it in the dustbin, um, it'll ferment. It'll begin to decompose. And it'll let off the most awful smell. The dustbin still looks amazing. It's still got flowers, it's still got butterflies and little children sitting in the garden. But inside of it is the most awful stench. And hypocrisy does that to us. Because on the outside we look amazing, but on the inside we stink. Doesn't matter what we do, doesn't matter how clean we make it, doesn't matter how well we act or behave, doesn't matter how much we clean up our speech, when we're, a pressure is applied to our lives, what is inside of us becomes apparent to the whole world. And what we need is for God to save us. But if we think we can do it ourselves by cleaning the outside of the, of the dustbin, or repainting the outside of the house, or watering the garden, or whatever it is that we might think is important, without attending to what's on the inside, we will just be full of dead men's bones. So here's the crunch. Our denial of the Holy Spirit can prevent Him from helping us when we really need His help. And when we have to defend what we believe, we can do this out of pure intellect, and a good argument, a great persuasive speech. And, you know, I, I saw a man a couple of years ago refuse to debate someone over the grounds that the man wanting to debate him was a professional debater. He could speak, he could articulate, he was very eloquent, and he could beat you by his, his mere prowess and control of the English language. But there will come a time in our lives when, we, when we're at a loss for words. I know for some people that's very hard to imagine. But when, when we don't really know what to say, that's the moment at which the Holy Spirit gives us the words. And I remember many years ago uh, trying to share Christianity with a friend of mine, and, and I was losing the argument, and was, was going backwards and forwards, and suddenly I felt something come over me, and it took control of me, and I just talked solidly for 20 minutes 
about the gospel. And the man that I was talking to had no response whatsoever because the words coming out of my mouth were not my words. And to this day, I cannot remember what I said. But I do know the Holy Spirit gave me the words to speak in order to help me defend what I believe. Our human ability will not do all that is possible to save us. It is the Holy Spirit who can and does give us that ability to save us. When it comes to salvation, it's the Holy Spirit who makes us able to respond to the Gospel. It's not a decision we make by ourselves. Otherwise, we wouldn't need God. And certainly, we wouldn't need Jesus to have gone to the cross. Because we could have done it all ourselves just by deciding. So, we have to respond to the Holy Spirit at times in our lives. So when the Spirit speaks to us and we ignore Him or shut Him up, that is the beginning of blaspheming against Him. When we eventually shut Him up altogether, that is blasphemy. Not allowing God to pardon us. When we live in a, a life of hypocrisy, and I'm summing up at this point, when it pervades our being, when we speak things in secret against God or against each other out of malice, when we live one way in public and another in private, when we continue to defy God willfully, that is when we are in great danger. And Jesus uses the words of hell being committed to hell. So my challenge to you today is to ask you if there's things in your life that are eating you from the inside, things that we entertain or practice that we would not be proud of our mother's sin, or not be proud of our friend's sin, and certainly wouldn't be proud of God's sin. But I got bad news for you, God can see it anyway. But if that is you, take time to choose to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you and to cleanse yourself of that evil. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2 says this Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Salvation is for eternal life, from our life of sin. But it's also a process. And we're all in that process. We all need to realize that we're still in need of the Holy Spirit to lead us out of our current lives into the life that He wants us to have in the future. God bless you all.